everyone, welcome back to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of The Sims. Before we get started today, if you like the video, please take a moment to hit like and subscribe. It helps out the channel. Today in the second episode in a series on ancient Egypt, we are looking at the Great Pyramids of Giza. And we're starting off this week, where we started off last time, Snefaru. So if you haven't seen part one, go do so now. Snefaru's Pyramid building odyssey resulted with the construction of the first real Finnish pyramid, but it was his son and successor, Khufu, who set the new standard for pyramids of Egypt. Khufu ruled from 2551 to 2528 BCE, and he set out from the get-go to break all records. His entire complex included a valley temple where the funeral barge would have arrived, a causeway from there into the mortuary temple at the base of the pyramid, where the rituals would have taken place, before his body and canopic jars would have been interred in the stone sarcophagus that had been built into the pyramid. The king's chamber, where his body would have been buried, is enormous, in its height rather than its dimensions. The chamber, as well as the gallery leading to it, were narrow but very tall, making use of various building tactics to transfer the weight of the stone above down around the space. The king's chamber uses a series of granite beams, while the gallery uses what's called a corbel arch. The queen's chamber below would have housed not the queen, but rather Khufu's Ka statue. His queens were buried in small pyramids on site in the complex. Whereas Khufu's father's pyramid had a 722 foot square base, a slope of 43 degrees and a height of 344 feet, Khufu's pyramid had a base of 755 feet square, a steeper slope of 51 degrees, which resulted in a final height of 481 feet. Khufu's pyramid is called the Great Pyramid, as in stand alone, and that is because Khufu's pyramid remained the tallest man-made structure for over 3,800 years until it was finally surpassed by the Lincoln Cathedral in 1311 CE. Khufu's son Khafre, who ruled from 2520 to 2494 BCE, followed in his father's footsteps. His pyramid is the second tallest at 471 feet, with a base of 705 foot square. Khafre's pyramid has one single chamber at the center of the pyramid, making it a little different from all the other pyramids that came before. His complex included the usual mortuary temple at the pyramid with a causeway leading to a valley temple at the river. But adjacent to that valley temple is a unique construction, what we call the Sphinx. The Sphinx is believed to have been built for Khafre primarily because it's carved out of the natural stone. They carved stone around it. And that stone that they cut out around the Sphinx was used to build the valley temple for Khafre next door. Therefore, it's generally accepted that Khafre's face is what we see on the Sphinx. But in reality, some archaeologists disagree. We're never actually going to know. It's The Sphinx will always remain kind of a mystery. The smallest of the three Giza pyramids was built by Minkare, the son of Khafre and grandson of Khufu. He reigned from 2490 to 2472 BCE. His pyramid is only about 335 feet by 343 feet at the base. It's 213 feet high and contains less than one-tenth of the stone of Khufu's Great Pyramid. His complex includes the standard temples and causeway, but also three mini pyramids for his queens. His son was the last pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, and he did not build a pyramid. And although pyramids were built for a thousand years in Egypt, none of them ever exceeded the Giza trio in size. So let's talk about some pyramid FAQs. Why are they so important? Well, the Great Pyramids of Giza are the only remaining of the original Seven Wonders of the World. And in fact, they're the only ones we know for certain existed. So that's why they're important. Also, there's the whole Great Pyramid being the largest man-made structure for 3,800 years. How many pyramids were built? As of today, there are about 140 known remaining pyramids and even more mastabas, with untold numbers lost to sands, looters, and scavengers. 
Cairo, as my professors told me in school, is built by the pyramids. As in, they stripped all the pyramids of their shiny limestone casings and used all that stone to build Cairo and the other modern cities in the area. So, in reality, we don't know for certain how many were built. We know at least high 130s. How did they build the pyramids? Well, the short answer to that is we don't know. The long answer to that is archaeological evidence suggests there wasn't one method that was used for all pyramids. That different methods were developed and changed over time and may have just been based on the preference and knowledge of those building it. We do know they used copper chisels to mine the soft limestone. They used sledges, probably over logs, to move the blocks from one spot to another. That the yellow limestone for the Great Pyramids came from that area and that the white limestone casing was brought in from somewhere else. And we know they used some method of ramps, ropes, and levers to move the blocks into place. And that's it. Pretty simple construction. How are the pyramids so accurate? Well, the Egyptians were possibly one of the most advanced cultures of their time. They were among the first to develop a writing system. They were the first to develop paper, papyrus. And they were one of the most mathematically advanced of the ancient worlds. And they lived in an environment that made surveying a necessity. Every year after the floods, they'd have to survey the land to redevelop field boundaries. And surveying is not technically complicated. You can do it with just a string. I see it all the time on construction projects, even today. I know several contractors and masons who prefer strings over lasers. To make a square base, you only need four sides of equal length and two equal diagonals. You can stake that out without a great level of difficulty. Not only have archaeologists found surveying equipment, they've also found the measuring tools. They had a measured ruler of sorts for their buildings that used a unit called the royal cubit, which changed from time to time, read from ruler to ruler, as in pharaoh to pharaoh, but was roughly 20.6 inches. And with surveying equipment and an actual ruler, you could in fact lay something out with a fair amount of accuracy. Who built the pyramids? Was it slaves? The basis for this question is typically the story of Moses in the Old Testament and the movies that Hollywood made depicting the story of the Passover. Moses would have lived during a period of ancient Egyptian history known as the New Kingdom, which was over a thousand years after the building of the pyramids. Hollywood is in the, mo- in the business of making movies. They're ma- in the business of making something that's very dramatic, very cinematic. We've all seen The Prince of Egypt, and if you haven't, you really should, because it's one of the best movies ever made. That opening scene with Deliver Us where you can see the slaves struggling to build, lift the great stones and to build the great temples and make the mud clay bricks. Very simply, is not real. Slavery did exist in ancient Egypt, and like every ancient culture, it was an incredibly complicated system. But slaves in ancient Egypt did not work on royal building projects. They worked in the fields and in the homes. It's not to say their duties would have been easy. Domestic slaves would have faced the same threats that domestic slaves have always faced throughout time. Field hands would have faced the same threats that they have always faced throughout time. In ancient Egypt, possibly more so, as they would have had to have contend with lions, which were in Egypt at that time, as well as hippos and crocodiles because all of the fields were immediately adjacent to the Nile River. But they would not have been building royal building projects. Very simply, Hollywood depicts one thing because it is more interesting and dramatic to show than people working in a field. In actuality, the people who built the pyramids of Giza were Egyptians. Uh, Archaeologists think that the construction may have occurred during the flooding season, which put an entire section of the year 
where citizens would have been out of work. What better way to keep them occupied and put a paycheck in their pocket than to have them work on a construction project that reinforces the religious beliefs that is literally holding everything together, including the government. They were literally building their pharaoh's stairway to heaven, and their pharaoh to them was a god. So this would have been a civic duty, it would have been a religious duty. For the pharaoh, it made good economic sense. It may have been slightly obligatory, like if you were invited by the pharaoh to come work at Giza, you probably couldn't have said no. And Dr. Leonard, one of the experts on Giza, likens it frequently to Game of Thrones. When House of Stark calls up a one of the lower houses to serve them, the lower houses come. Archaeologists have found on the site of Giza, the city in which all the laborers lived. It's huge vast, enormous, and contains a lot of archaeological evidence that backs up that these were paid laborers, citizens, rather than slaves, primarily evidence regarding their diet. They lived off a diet of beer, bread, and beef. Beef was, at the time, the most expensive meat in Egypt. And very simply, from the evidence, it suggests they were eating beef every single day, and you would not be feeding slaves the most expensive meat available every single day. But you would do that for your loyal citizens. The groups of workers also apparently organized themselves into sort of like gangs or unions, and they gave themselves nicknames. And they left those nicknames on the areas of the site that they were responsible for in the form of graffiti. Most notably, a group that worked on the Pyramid of Mekare called themselves the Drunks of Mekare. So no, slaves did not build the pyramids, but they were in Egypt, and life for them would have been hard. Why are there pyramids all over the world? Isn't this proof of some kind of connection? Imagine if you will, you're an ancient society without gas-powered cranes. You want to build something that will last forever, so stone, not wood that is taller than anything around it, so it may reach your gods in the heavens. Basically, every ancient culture had a version of the sun god. How would you do it? A square base is the easiest to lay out. We've already talked about that. Four equal sides, two equal diagonals. Easy. Then you would build every layer a little smaller than the layer before. When there's a giant pile of rubble, does the pile of rubble resemble a cube or a pyramid? They would have been, e it'd be easy to emulate a form you would see in nature. But also very simply, it's easier to build a pyramid than it is to build a cube. Less stone, less foundation preparation, less labor. Pyramids were built by everyone because pyramids are easy to build. Did aliens build the pyramids? No, it really is as simple as that. This belief stems around the idea that there's no possible way such an early ancient culture could be so sophisticated as to build these great wonders, but they were and they did. We have the archaeological evidence, we have the primary sources, these weren't perfect structures that just magically appeared in the desert. There were a lot of failures on the road to Giza. A lot of collapses. And the Giza pyramids themselves are not perfect. So no, aliens didn't build them. Humans did. So thanks for joining me today as we looked at the Great Pyramids of Egypt. March is Women's History Month. So very fittingly, next time, for part three from ancient Egypt, we are looking at one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs and one of their most prolific builders, Queen Hatshepsut. Until then, you can find me on Instagram at Simming History and on the Sims 4 Gallery where there'll be playable versions of many of my builds on this channel. I'll see you all next time. Bye!